everyone. Welcome to the DuSable Black History Museum and Education Center. We are so honored to have these runoff candidates here. And I want to just thank Reverend Mitchell Johnson and Tony Romanucci, our organizers and sponsors for this evening. Uh, I'm Perry Irma, I'm President and CEO of the DuSable. Thank you, thank you. And uh, it's, it's just a real joy. You know, this is such an historic moment in our city, in our community, in the nation for this city, this world-class city, to have two amazing candidates who are vying for our mayoralty. And this community is the most significant in terms of what happens to the future of our city. And so I just want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank candidate Johnson, candidate Vallis, uh, for joining us tonight. Thank you. And I have to make a shameless plug for the DuSable Museum that all of you who are not yet members of this great world-class institution, please consider becoming members of the DuSable tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to hand this mic over to the illustrious Reverend Mitchell Johnson Esquire. Round of applause, please, for Gary Elman and just talking to them. I would be remiss if I did not stop even before making any comment and ask Bishop Stephen Braxton to join us. Please look at Bishop Braxton. I know you can't move fast, but move quick. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Bishop Stephen Braxton. Good evening, everybody. Let us be quiet and still and go within. Think about the goodness of the Lord, how he's blessed you. Also think about the things that you've had on the road of swift transition, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But think him anyway because of the bad things there's growth. So tonight we want to make sure that we're settled, that we're centered, and we're ready to hear from our candidates. Let us pray. Oh great God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time and this moment. As we come to you today, we ask that you would bind us together, so close that one cannot fall for the other. Let us be concerned about each other. Let us be conscious of caring and nurturing of each other. As we listen to the candidates tonight, we want to thank you for your provision. We want to thank you for your protection. We want to thank you for the faithfulness in each of our lives. And as we go forth tonight, oh God, we want to thank you because you is our choice. You are our hope, and you are the only source. Bind us together in one accord that cannot be broken. And let us have an open mind as we listen to the candidates to see how they are on point with the things that we are in need of and that we can be complicit with them for. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. We all said, amen, 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 amen and amen. God bless you. It's always good to start even a political meeting with calmness and centers, and here's why. None of you are concerned with what is wrong with any of these candidates. What you're concerned about is what you're going to do to make Chicago a safe community, a healthy community, an economically vibrant community, and every single one of you in this room is concerned about your children, even baby's children. Come on, somebody. So all we want to hear is what you're going to do. You got here based in part on providence. 
But you'll be sworn in because you're the best hope of the city of Chicago. And thank each and every one of you guys for coming. I now hand this microphone on to my great friend. I said great, right? I sure did, Tony Romanucci. Great, one more time. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I think this is a terrific opportunity for us to hear from our two candidates. And quickly introduce myself. My name is Antonio Romanucci. Everybody calls me Tony. That's right, yeah. So why am I here tonight? I was asked that question yesterday, actually, by Reverend Johnson when we were on the radio. And the reason I am here is more than one reason. There are actually 62 reasons why I'm here, and that's my age. Because for my entire life, whether I have lived or I have worked in this city, I know it just as well as anybody can in 62 years, and that's why I love it and I care for it so very much. I started out my career as an attorney when I was a Cook County Public Defender. So I got to see the judicial system in a way that most lawyers don't get to see it. I saw the underbelly of the judicial system in the what? The most uni largest unified court system in the country. At least it was at that time. And I worked in all the branch courts in the city. You name it, I worked it, I saw it. So tonight, we have a very very important step to take in our city's future. And with our next mayor, one of these gentlemen will be elected, our next mayor, and they will affect change. Change that might not happen overnight, but indeed probably will take even a generation. But we need to start. We need to get there. The list of issues is long, and we all know as Reverend Johnson said, that our city's crime, the economic development, those are all priority issues. Public safety is an issue. Policing is an issue. And this is an issue which I have dedicated most of my life to because when people know me, they say I'm a civil rights attorney. And it's paradoxical that we stand here today and we also mourn the loss of one of our officers today who was buried. Officer Vasquez Lasso. But Chicago still has an issue with policing. We're under a consent decree. Very fundamental issues must be addressed, and I value the role that police play in this city as well as the community that they serve, because that's how it's said. That's how it is in that order. So we will talk about policing today along with all of the other issues, culture, community, the economy, and education. I want to thank both candidates for your willingness to be here tonight and for sharing your views at the questions that will be asked of you tonight. We are all here because we love this city, as we know that both of you do. And it's my hope that that love leads to a multitude of, ch of generational change in this city. So let me call up our first panel of questioners. And if I may call up Ms. Adia Hayden, she is a local panelist with the Growth and Transformation Consultant. She's a prophet and co-host of the MCP Hour at WCPT. Thank you, Ms. Hayden. Hello. Next up, we want to call Pastor Phil Jackson. He is the founder and CEO of the Fire Firehouse Community Arts Center. Pastor Jackson, thank you so much. Before we start, I, I got to do what we have to do. There are rules to this game here tonight, right? They're not on thrones, but we're gonna. There are some rules here. So here are the rules. So the winner of the coin toss prior to the forum decides if they want to give their opening and closing statements first, or give their opening and closing comments second. Who won the coin toss? Do we know? Was there a coin toss? Guess what? Who's got a coin? Do you need a coin? I don't have one. I, who carries a coin? Who has a coin? Let's do this coin toss. Thank you, sir. 
Who wants to call it? It's heads. Mr. Johnson, you get to pick the opening, or you want to open first? Well, I thought I got to keep the quarter. You, oh, no. <laughs> you will go first. And the other two rules, candidates will have one minute to respond to each question asked by the panelists. One minute, if a candidate's name is mentioned during an initial answer, they will have 15 seconds to respond once per question. I will keep track of time. I will try and nudge you as time expires. Johnson, please. Oh, you got, you're mic'd up. Very good. You have one minute for opening statement. All right, well, good evening and thank you all. I'm grateful to be here and very humbled. And again, my condolences to Office of Vice So I'm running for Mayor of the City of Chicago to usher in a better, stronger United City. For too long in the city of Chicago, we've lived under this tale of two cities. For those who have, get more, and those with less, things continue to get taken away from them. We need to have one story for one Chicago. Families have awakened every single day for too long where they've had to chase down an economy that's behind them while everything in front of them is crumbling. It doesn't have to be that way. And we can build a better, stronger, safer Chicago together. It's going to take all of us. And the truth of the matter is that the politics of old that have left families behind have created the type of economic despair that has caused deep, deep poverty. Public safety, of course, being top in mind, my wife and I raising our three children on the west side of Chicago, and we love the west side. The Austin neighborhood, but it's one of the more bothered neighborhoods in the city of Chicago. If we're going to have a better, stronger, safer Chicago, we have to do what safe American cities do around this country, and that's invest in people. I'm looking forward to the conversations today, and looking forward to becoming the next mayor of the city of Chicago. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dallas, you have a little bit over a minute, equal time. Well, thank you. It's, it's great to be back here in, at the Gustavo uh, Museum. I've been here on many, many occasions. I have the pleasure of working with Perry Irma at the Chicago Public Schools and, of course, on, on Haiti issues. Uh, there's a leadership crisis in the city of Chicago today, and I think that's the reason you had so many candidates running, and certainly the reason that the commissioner and myself are running. Uh, every single problem that the city is facing, from a degraded, uh, uh, demoralized police department to a school, a school system that has, has lost students in record numbers, 18 of the last 20 years, uh, to a budget that is increasingly unbalanced, uh, increasingly is incurring uh, or is imposing additional taxes, fines, and fees, yet fi finds itself incapable of investing in long, long uh, disinvested communities. Um, all those problems emanate from bad decisions on the fifth floor. Uh, I'm running to bring the type of leadership to the fifth floor that can, you know, that can change the dynamic. Uh, it's about uh, bringing the right leadership to the police department that can return the city to community-based policing with full accountability. It's about uh, increasing the quality of public school choices. It's about taking this $20 billion budget and allocating it in ways that invest in long, neglected communities. That's what this is about. And it's not a solo act. It's about uh, assembling and drawing the team from the community because it's only through a community effort. It's only through an administration. It's only through an administration uh, that has the type of leadership that can get the city back on track. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Ms. Hayden, you have the first question. Yes. Hello. Um, so while we know that environmental topics are top of mind for millennial and Gen Z voters, we also know that climate risks are business risks, which are the same, or also public health risks. So what will your administration do to usher in sustainable, inclusive growth for the city of Chicago that doesn't only count businesses and the communities, but the environment as well? Okay, well thank you for that question. Look, environmental justice and climate justice is top of mind for everyone. And having grown up with asthma, I certainly understand the the challenges that many of our communities face because we don't have clean air um, and clean water. 
And so that's why I'm not only going to expand with the Department of the Environment with real staff members, but I'm also going to make sure that we pass within the first 100 days of my administration a cumulative impact study so that we can have a full assessment of where we are. Look, the bottom line is this. There are tremendous opportunities in green technology, retrofitting our buildings, making sure that we are attracting businesses here, biotech and life sciences. But our education system has to be able to play a part of that. That's why I was a part of the hunger strike at Dye High School to make sure that it remained open. Green technology was a part of the curriculum there that we had to fight to make sure that it actually existed. Under my administration, climate justice and environmental justice, top of mind. So let me take on the issue of uh, the environment. First of all, we need to create a real Department of the Environment, so, a, a, a department which I actually funded and expanded as a budget director. And the City Council needs an environmental uh, protection committee that can oversee that department. And, and, and that department needs to focus on the, the, the following priorities. First of all, developing a climate change plan. There's been so many plans introduced. And you can use and leverage TIF funds to provide the capital investments needed to implement that plan. Secondly, You've got to prioritize environmental justice, and that means just not preventing polluted industries from moving to the south side and west side. We need to get polluted industries out of the city altogether. And third, someone's got to address the issue of lead in the water, and we'll be waiting decades to replace the lead pipes. We need water filtration systems in every home because it's not only lead poisoning, but there's other cancer causes and contaminants. And then finally, that EPA department needs to focus on food justice. There is no reason why we can't open a series of city-owned community stores throughout the city that can contract out with the big suppliers so that there is not a neighborhood that does not have access to health care. Amen. I'm going to pull up my notes for the second one. I have some, uh, some numbers here. <laughs> um, according to the annual housing report in 2021, the City Department of Housing spent $290 million in resources to create and preserve affordable rent rental units in Chicago, but only $37.8 million for affordable home ownership, and that included preserving existing homes and developing new homes. So we know that home ownership is a key gateway to building generational wealth. Um, and right now that uh, black communities, Latino communities don't have parity with the white communities and homeowners here in Chicago. So what will your administration do to expand home ownership access, uh, particularly for millennials who are starting to flock more to the suburbs? Well, I think, <laughs> yes. It's Mr. Ballas, yes. Well, I think what you have to do is you have to reverse that dynamic and you, and you have to reduce, uh, and you have to reverse that share. I mean, when we did our capital improvement plan, $3.2 billion, 55% of those contracts went to minority and women-owned businesses. And so the point is the city can reverse that percentage. Uh, and there's no reason why the city hasn't done it, and it's criminal that they have not. But also the city needs to start using tax increment financing for affordable housing, which they do not do. Lincoln Yards gets a, a billion dollars in infrastructure, and what does affordable housing get from TIFs? I mean, you can issue bonds to amortize the interest with revenues that will be freed up when the TIFs retire, and, and you, could, you could generate billions of dollars that you could invest in affordable housing all over the city, and you could use that money to subsidize first-time home buyers because the building of community wealth and ownership is transferable from generation to generation. So there's no reason why this can't be a problem. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson. You know, when my wife and I purchased our first home in Austin, it's my only home. I uh, won't be able to afford to another home um, because the cost of living has uh, exacerbated the property taxes is what is driving many of the families out. And so that's why I've released a budget plan that eliminates the structural deficit that was caused in the 90s. We eliminate that debt. We make up to $1 billion of investment, and we do it without raising property taxes. When we purchased our first home, we made $80,000 combined for a home that cost $150,000. And we needed two government programs to help us purchase our first home. $80,000 combined, six degrees, and we were the richest people in our family. Do you know that black folks who make $100,000 a year or more live in less safe communities than white families that make less than 30000 So when we're talking about generational wealth, this is about creating a pathway to home ownership. 
And that requires down payment assistance, but it also requires us not to raise property taxes. That's the difference between Paul and I. It is a difference. And so I'm going to make sure though, that we protect home ownership by not only creating a pathway to home ownership, but let's make sure that people don't lose their homes because they can't afford it because property taxes continue to be the only way in which this, company, this city can balance its budget. Under my administration, we will not balance the budget of the backs of black people who work with you. Let me point out that the city did have a structural uh, uh, balance budget in the 1990s, and the schools were left with almost a billion dollars in cash balances. But you know, raising the head tax and raising the tax on hotel motel, uh, the hotel motel, which is already the highest in the nation, is not going to balance the city's budget. The city controls $20 billion in spending, and I spent my entire career balancing multi-billion dollar budget. Um, third question, please. Oh, no, thank you. Okay. Oh, so over to Pastor Jackson. What's going on? What's going on from the West Side? I'm going to bring the heat. <laughs> but I serve at the, as the CEO and founder of Firehouse Community Arts Center, and our work is to hire and recruit the most violent young men we can in North Lauderdale and empower them with the kings that they're going to be in, in employment. And what we want to ask, some of you have some questions around that too, is what is really uh, a, a tangible way um, to impact the lives of young people who are affected by violence and those who are uh, surrounded in communities that are affected by violence to create safer communities without policing safety, without creating it to just be policed to create safety, where organizations can be empowered um, on a grassroots level. What are your plans or ideas around that? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you for looking at the fact that, you know, look, we spend, more on police per capita than anywhere else in the world. And we have to ask ourselves, are we any safer? Look, I'm raising a family in Austin, on the west side of Chicago. It takes two years to become a police officer. We can't wait two years for our communities to be safe. You know, so this is why in my public safety plan, I call for the doubling amount of young people that we will hire, not just for summer programs, but for year-round uh, hire programs. Because there is a direct correlation between youth employment and violence production. Pastor Phil, I've taught in Cabrini Green. I've looked into the eyes of young people who are discouraged and they don't feel seen and valued. Under my administration, it's not just about loving the city, it's about loving people. Where your heart is, your treasure will be. Right? It, it, it lines up. And so investing in young people to make sure our parks and recreation and arts, all these opportunities for young people to contribute and to actually have an opportunity to experience the economy of one of the richest cities in the world. No one should be too poor to live in one of the richest cities in the world. And under my administration, we're going to make sure we're going to invest in young people. So let me answer your question. The first thing we can do is demand that every city department, every agency, every contractor, uh, all the labor unions, of which I have talked to almost all of them, create paid work study jobs for all of our high school students. There's no reason why every high school student can't participate in a paid work study job. Just not doubling, but tripling and quadrupling. Second, there are 100,000 100, Chicagoans aged 16 to, I think it's 24 or 25, University of Illinois study that are not in school and they're not in the employment ranks. So we've got to do something to address their issues by opening up uh, and reopening alternative schools for, uh, that provide adult and occupational training, and we've got to have a strategy for returning citizens. We have tens of thousands of individuals who are released from incarceration. We need to get them into paid work study jobs. We need to get them housing, and we need to remove the obstacles for them re-entering the economy and getting jobs. And there's no reason why we can require contractors to set aside jobs for those returning citizens. Pastor Jackson, I just want to remind the audience to please make sure your cell phones are turned on mute or, or off so that the candidates uh, are able to answer their questions. I mean, I, I get your point. Uh, you know, I'm dealing with guys with gun charges. I'm, I'm dealing with guys whose life will change and transform. They may not be able to have access to those opportunities like this. So my other question is, you talk about schools. I mean, Manly High School, that can house at one point 1,200 young people. Houses 84 kids right now. Right? Only, only like 2% or whatever percent of the, of the school is being used. 
and their reading level is at 2%, math level is at 1%. They can't even keep with nobody like in frickin' Oak Park. So I don't even know if you build a school for uh, whoever, if the quality of education for these cats is gonna continue to perpetuate. I don't wanna bring no kids in that kind of context. We need, uh, so my question is, what will be done now to, to mobilize schools to be competitive with young people who want to go back to school? I mean, I'm in schools every day and there's an apathy that's there, right? What, what will be done to create um, a better, stronger, engaging learning environment? Well, I think we need to, we need to, yes, I think we need to do the following things. So let me point out that enrollment grew 40,000 during my tenure and it was 125,000 higher than it is today. We actually had to open 30 new public schools. So, you know, let me tell you what I would do. First of all, you need to push the money down to the local school level. Mm -hmm. Only 60% of the $30,000 a year they spend is actually finding its way into the classroom. And you need to empower the principals and the local school councils to have a say-so in what the schools are offering. Secondly, those schools have got to be community schools. They've got to be open through the dinner hour, on the weekends, in the summer, over the holidays, and you've got to bring community-based organizations onto the school so they provide activities and enrichment and support not only for students and their families. The third thing we have to do, and I'm going to say it again, universal work study. Universal work study. And the, for all the students, and the fourth thing you have to do is there is funding available at the state and federal level to, to open alternative schools for overage underachievers. In fact, there is a law on the state books that allow you to open adult high schools for those 18 to 24 year olds who are out there, they're, they have no skills, they don't have a high school diploma, and there is plenty available for it. You want to fill those empty buildings? Fill, fill them with the tens of thousands of students who have left the system and can re-enter the system through adult ed and occupational training. Thank you. Well, the first thing that we have to do is we have to close the gap between graduation and job opportunities. If you're poor in the city of Chicago, and you make it all the way to 12th grade, and someone comes to you and they say, you're not done yet. You gotta go to school for four more years, borrow one hundred thousand dollars, and we're not sure if you're gonna have a job that you get back. Okay. There are fifty-five thousand vacancies right now in manufacturing positions. I put this on my website. It's part of the education plan too. The average salary of manufacturing gigs that are available right now, eighty, eighty-five thousand dollars. That's more than what my wife and I made combined, and we had six degrees between the two of us. Can I also just say something? This narrative that our children are not proficient, keep in mind that it's based on a standardized test that has history and eugenics that is trying to prove that black people were free. That is their argument our children as failures, they're living in poverty, they are without homes, our people don't have jobs, Unemployment rate in our communities looked like the Great Depression era numbers when white men were unemployed and our country called it a national crisis and they gave white men shovels before they put things to dig. No one called it entitlement. No one called it a handout. But when our people are suffering and struggling, then all of a sudden, we're not achieving. We've got stuff to do, things to build, and lives to change. And under my administration, we're going to invest in people what would all that stuff about talking about our people because they can't pass a standardized test? How about we actually do something better than a standardized test by giving people jobs? Yeah. 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 Mr. Jackson, do you have another question? Yeah, one more question, one more question. So, um, uh, when we were on the 10th district in North Bondio, um, there was a program, and maybe it's another community too, DCOs, right? And officers who were in the community, we had a basketball game with the police and the fire department, and the particular commander that was there, uh, Calderon, was the bomb, and he had it laid out. We served so many families, uh, 200 families a, a week food, and the uh, officers come every week and deliver food. New commander comes, and the, we meet with the commander about the DCOs, and they're no longer around. They're not as accessible. We believe that connection with officers in the community really can create um, a, a, another shift of peaceful communities. Officers would call us and say, hey, we got one of these guys that we think you worked with, can you come in and work with, catch him before we have to arrest him. It was a great camaraderie. What will you do in the academy and other things like that to create a space where officers don't arrest first? They're not trying to pursue that first, but they're really embed, uh, in, 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 embedded with the, with the community to be able to create holistic betterment in the neighborhood. Yeah. 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 Thank you for that question, Pastor Phil. So I woke up every single day on over 15 years ago, showing up in our schools every single day, serving our young people in some of the most difficult situations. 
You know the hardest part about my job as a teacher is when I was asked to do someone else's job. We're putting too much pressure on police officers. We're asking them to do their job and someone else's. The way we actually restore confidence in police and community relationships is by making sure that one, that we're not asking them to, do, to be social workers and counselors and therapists, but two, 200 and so officers just came to the academy. 15 of them were black. Black folks are not passing the psychological exam. It's the same standardized test that are harming our children. Listen, you get knocked off the police academy, academy if you have debt, bad fighting scores, if you have misdemeanors. We're not even creating a pathway for our people to serve on the front line. Under my administration, this is why we can promote 200 more detectives by giving an opportunity for them to actually take a test, develop the cut score that gives them a better position to perform better on it. In the 15th district, real quick, real quick, 15th district, Austin, we have built an entire baseball league with, with police officers. The following part, Austin, come on, Austin wins every year, by the way. Here's what we can do, actually, to help engender confidence and support, but we can't keep asking police officers to do their job and someone else's. Yeah. We have 1,700 fewer police officers than we had in 2019, and last year, 400,000 high priority 911 calls, including 32,000 assaults and batteries in progress, did not have a police car available. And, and I monitor the districts, and on some nights, in the 11th district, the most violent district, probably in the nation, uh, there are some nights when they only have half the police cars to respond. So we've got to fill the ranks. And the ranks can be filled, and hopefully we'll get another question on how they can be filled. And at the end of the day, because you have to have community-based policing, you need police officers who know you and who you know by name and by badge number, because that's the ultimate accountability. The second thing we need to do is we need to train these police officers on how to do more than simply policing. So when you talk about your programs like that, training and retraining and redundant training and redundant training. Number three is if you really want to create a pipeline for the next generation of police officers, you create it through the military academy and ROTC programs. There are 10,000 children in ROTC programs in Chicago Public Schools. 86% of them are black and Latino. 46% of them are women. That's your pipeline. That's your pipeline. I'm actually opening a not-for-profit in Arkansas, a military first responder academy, 800 kids, over 80% will be black and Latino, and they all have paid internships with police, fire, EMT, EMS, avionics, and nursing. There's no reason why the next pipeline, the generation of all first responders, just not police, can come from the very neighborhoods that they serve. Thank you. <laughs> Gentlemen, I have a question for you now. And my question is this. Both of you have committed to making Chicago a safer city. Indeed, one of you has said that you wish to make Chicago the safest city in America. Please articulate, now with specificity, your goals in achieving this mission of crime reduction consistent with, here's the key word, constitutional policing. Meaning, you will make our city safer without falling back on failed policies such as stop and frisk and SOS and suppression units, which ultimately could violate citizens' constitutional rights. Please share your points. Okay, great. Well, you know, first of all, you know, I'll tell you what you have to do. You, you have got to open the schools and you've got to find safe and secure places and work study opportunities for the, for the high school kids so that they are fully engaged so that the burden doesn't fall on other community-based organizations as well as the police. Second, you've got to have reentry programs for returning citizens. So you can get at many of the underlying causes of violence in the community. You've got to provide economic opportunities, reentry programs, training, as well as move the obstacles to be hired. But with respect to the police, you not only have to restore community-based policing, and you've got to create the supervisory infrastructure. So you have one officer supervising 10 cops instead of one officer supervising, one sergeant supervising 300. But what you have to do is you've got to provide that supervisory infrastructure, and you've got to provide the type of redundant training again and again and again so that these police are trained and they understand what they can and cannot do and they understand what constitutional policing is about. And what you finally have to do is you have to implement the consent decree. And the consent decree is the floor, is, it, it is not, it, it, not the ceiling. The consent decree is the minimum things that need to be implemented. So you've got to make sure that you select a superintendent and you select a deputy mayor for public safety who is committed 
uh, and is experienced and is drawn from the community and supported by the community to implement the consent decree. Mr. Dallas, just because I, I, I tend to do this, and I'll do it with Mr. Johnson also, it's fair as fair. Will you commit to not bring back failed policies such as stop and frisk and SOS? Yes, absolutely. Mr. Johnson? Yeah, so public, public safety is um, a, a, a it's a severe problem for the entire city. It, it is quite serious. And Wednesday night, the day after February 28th, uh, my son and I were still up at about 11 o'clock from the adrenaline. Uh, gunshots right outside my front door again. I live it every single day. And that's why you have to do, deal with the immediate challenge and long term. So we're going to promote 200 more detectives, train them, so that we can actually solve crime. You can't engender confidence if, if crime is committed and we're not solving it. We have to do that. We also have to make sure it's going to cost me minimally $50 million to in, implement the consent decree. Part of the consent decree is to make sure that our research institutions are providing the policy so that we can actually transform our system. We're not even doing that. But again, it's, it's about youth employment and investment. There's a greater predictor of reducing violence by actually hiring young people. Look, the bottom line is this, safe cities in America all have one thing in common. They love the people enough to invest in them. We have to make sure that we are, the, the laws that are on the book right now, the red flag laws, where people have guns that should not have them. You gotta get those guns off the street. Look, Citadel is entering into this race against me. Citadel is responsible for manufacturing more guns. We have to understand what's at stake in this moment. So this is about doing what works, but we can't use the politics of old that continues to put guns in the street, ignore our young people, don't solve crimes, asking police officers to do more than their job if we're going to have a safe city. Under my administration, a better, stronger, safer Chicago is possible because I'm prepared and willing to invest in people. And yes, and yes, to work in the city. And so the yes and yes is that you will commit to constitutional police. Johnson, great, great Reverend Johnson. Watch out. <laughs> what, what statement can I just make? I appreciate the movement too. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I will let I will let the leader. <laughs> <laughs> Round of applause for this first group of panelists, please. Bill Johnson from Firehouse Community Life Center. Thank you very much for coming back to the table. And Adia Haley from Profit and Beverly and CPT. Thank you so very much. Pastor Phil. Pastor Phil. Now we're going to move on to our national panelists. And I will call them up. Attorney Lisa Duarte. Attorney Lisa Duarte. Founder, Point of Different Strategies and Partner. For Coach Fairchild, Duarte, and Barris. What you don't know, it is the largest woman owned attorney law firm in the state of Illinois. One of the top five women owned law firms in the nation. You want to go around and clap your hands because if I told you something different, you wouldn't. So go ahead and give that that which is hers. And then we have Reverend Dr. Keith McGee, former president of the United Baptist State Convention of Illinois. Reverend Dr. Keith McGee. Clap your hands for my good friend and brother, Pastor from Messiah Temple Missionary Baptist Church of Chicago. Now, the two of you have heard the rules. I know you're very smart. <laughs> Amen. We're going to stick to the rules, all right? That works for me. That works for me. Um, Pastor McGill, I'm going to go with age first. Uh, Lisa, do I have your question? Thank you. To both the candidates, both of your solutions to public safety have focused on the police department. We all know that true and lasting public safety solutions must be holistic and include all aspects of a criminal justice system, specifically the Office of the Cook County Sheriff, the Cook County State's Attorney, and the Chief Judge of the Circuit Court of Cook County. Please explain to the voters how your public, strategy safe, public safety strategy will successfully interact with the policies and practices of these primary public safety partners, and what metrics will you use to measure that success? Brother Jackson. Yeah, so actually my public safety plan is an investment plan, and it is holistic. You know, promoting 200 more detectives, that's the main component. That's the only policing component. 
that have called for repeatedly is passing through the ash bomber. It's an ordinance that will provide first responders to respond to ultimately what 40% of the 9 calls are, which are mental health crises. I grew up with asthma, still struggle with it. If I'm having an asthma attack, why am I calling 911 for the police officers to show up? Right? That's what's happening in the mental health crisis. Police officers are being asked to do too much. By making sure that we have first responders, EMT, uh, mental health crisis providers, that will free up law enforcement to deal with the more severe body crimes. Over 40% of the violence that happens in the city of Chicago, it happens in 6% of the city of Chicago. We know what's going to take place. Right? So this is about being smart. As far as interaction with the other dynamics of government, look, I'm an organizer. I'm collaborating on multiple levels as a teacher, as an organizer, as a Cook County Commissioner. In fact, as a Cook County Commissioner, I have to collaborate with all of them. Board President, Constitution Protected, Countywide Officials, I'm going to do that as mayor of the city of Chicago. Now, my tapping the microphone merely says the minute has lapsed. Don't take it personally. Paul oh, Vance. Great. Well, look, you know, first of all, the mayor needs to start meeting with all the parties. I remember Mayor Daly, staff, everybody. So, uh, Evanson, uh, uh, the Cook County uh, State's Attorney was in the office, the uh, FBI was in the office. The bottom line is there needs to Excuse be. Excuse me, Mr. Ballas, stop, please. If you're going to interrupt the candidate, I'm just going to give him another minute. Respect. Okay. Well, thank you. Respect. Mr. Ballas, please. Look, I think the mayor needs to demonstrate the leadership to bring all the parts together so they're not fighting each other, but they're actually coordinating. And that's something that I will do as mayor. That's something that I've always done. Secondly, we've got to recognize, and I actually did this work for Sally Yates in the Justice Department, we've got to create adult and occupational training alternatives to incarceration. Why are we in part, we have drug treatment alternatives to incarceration. Why don't we have adult and occupational training alternatives to incarceration? Third, and I'm going to say it over and over and over again, uh, we don't have programs for returning citizens. Uh, and, and the data is overwhelming that if, you, if someone has a high school diploma and, and they are occupationally trained, uh, the recidivism rate almost, it, it's virtually obliterated. So we've got to have a strategy. We've got to have a strategy for addressing the needs of returning citizens. They've got to have an opportunity to re-enter the economy and have housing and training and remove the obstacles that they're being hired. And we need to create an alternative to incarceration. Just as we've attempted to do it, and not well, I might add, to those who have had long-term drug addictions, and I lost a son to long-term drug addictions. We've got to do it for people who commit first-time offenses. Thank you, Mr. Dallas. Dr. McGee. Good evening, Mr. Dallas and Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Johnson, you mentioned something earlier about the tale of two cities, a very great literary work to celebrate today. I want to quote for you before I question some of the words uh, to acclimate those around us uh, to be a little more familiar with, with our line of questioning. Uh, it says in the book, the first paragraph, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of us, its noises, authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil and superlative degree of comparison only. In light of that, what can you lead our city to do in collaboration with our county government to make Chicago a model city in spite of the times. Oh, great. Well, you know, first of all, we have to cooperate with all of the government, whether it's on public safety, whether it's on development, whether it's on more effective land use, whether it's on uh, whether it's on schools, adult ed occupational training. And clearly the county has responsibilities and functions and and they have interests in those areas, as does the city, but we also need to get the state involved, too, because right now we're facing, for example, uh, a, a potential meltdown in mass transit. And the, and the CTA, 18% of the fare box, 18, uh, or 18% of the operating budget, not comes from the fare box. That means when COVID money runs out, that um, the CTA could go bankrupt. 
and or dramatically raise credits, which will only reduce ridership even more. But yet the RTA is also in crisis. The whole region is facing a, pot a potential catastrophic meltdown. So we've got to understand that there are just not Cook County and Chicago solutions, but regional solutions to many of the problems that we're facing. And those regional solutions need to be addressed because it's only through uh, uh, county, city, and regional solutions, whether it's economic development, whether it's job training, whether it's mass transit, uh, uh, you know, the, it's only through a collective effort that we can tackle these problems in a serious and substantive way. Well, thank you for that quote. It's very powerful words. And I'm happy to have the support of Cook County Board President Tony Franklin. So that collaboration has already been done. The first time in the history of our region, we're going to have two public school teachers running the city of Chicago and Cook County government. Always put social studies teachers in charge. <laughs> um, we've already started that collaboration. You know, we talked about transportation. We brought pace and metro together. CTA didn't come to the table. Not here, CTA made the table. That collaboration also can take place with our healthcare system, particularly around our mental health care services. I've made a commitment that we're going to reopen the mental health centers and cook with the government and pay for the What we also can do is that, particularly when it comes to insurance, right? We are outsourcing too many of our services. There are potential costs, significant cost savings by making sure that our insurance operation, that we could essentially run ourselves between Cook County and the city of Chicago, all of that is possible because I ultimately believe that we have to move towards a single payer system. Healthcare is a human right that should not be based on W-2s. And so these are opportunities that we can have here. Unlike my colleague Tony, who asked this question last, I'm going to interrupt the two of you and ask a question about the ninth ward, not the tenth ward, but the ninth ward. Here's why. Uh, gentlemen, Burnham was, as you know, an urban planner. When he wrote the plan for the city of Chicago, he envisioned a rail system that went to the extension of every part of the city of Chicago. On today, if you fly a plane over Chicago, you'll think the rail ends at 95th Street. For some reason, everyone living south of 95th to 130th, whether it's Oak Hill Garden or in your community, Roseland, they have no train. We know transit-oriented development builds communities. So the question is, folk in Roseland, they don't mind if the blue line gets an upgrade, if the green line gets an upgrade. They want them to have better trains, but can they at least get a Hugo train? <laughs> they gotta get something. So the question is, what will your administration do to ensure that marginalized communities like Oak Hill Gardens, like Roseland, that they have access to the same transportation and economic boom that comes from transportation? Mr. Bowles, you can go first. Well, you know, first of all, my pledge is to make sure that every community has access to public transportation. But what we also have to do with public transportation, is we've got to make sure that public transportation is as safe as going to the airport. Because when you've lost, when 50% of the ridership are afraid to take the CTA, uh, are afraid that the CTA is unsafe, you've got to do a crisis. What we also have to do uh, along these lines, particularly the red line, for example, is we've got to secure that property. We've got to secure property along those lines. We've got to secure the property. We've got to remediate the property. We've got to provide 10-year property tax abatements. And we have to create conditions to spur economic development along those lines, whether it's the restoration of community-based social services, whether it's retail, whether it's food marts, et cetera. Because some of those lines um, go through communities that have been devastating. So there's got to be a broader economic. So transportation, number one, but also taking those corridors and providing the type of land acquisition, the type of site prep and site remediation, and providing the type of long-term property tax abatements that allow for economic activities to splurge along those lines, because that will sustain those lines. That will increase the ridership. Thank you, sir. Mr. Johnson. Yeah, look, this is what I was referring to, the collaboration that, that we did at the Cook County level that brought Pace and Metro together. Um, CTA didn't come to the table. I'm going to make sure the CTA is on the table because that zone there, until we finish the extension, we have to find other ways in which we can use the other services to help that, that line continue. And that's what I'm prepared to do. We also have to create bus-only lanes and extend bus uh, lines to go well beyond the, the city limits. Like there, there's nothing that's preventing us from having these type of collaborative efforts except for the politics, right? Bus only lanes that are clear and designed, traffic signals that give preference to the, to the 
um, to the bus lanes, but we also have to make sure you all that we are increasing the ridership by making sure that public school students should not have to pay to get a ride to school. Seniors should not have to pay to ride public transportation. Low income families should have reduced fare. People who overwhelmingly use public transportation are the working people who support my candidacy. These are social workers, these are counselors, these are child care providers, these are the wage workers. So by doing that, collaborating is going to create an opportunity for a robust transportation system. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Dr. McGee. Thank you, Reverend Johnson. Uh, gentlemen, as a C4 city, Chicago is a C4 city, and a city's climate leadership group, how can we offer better solutions and collaboration with county government in fighting climate crisis, drive action to reduce greenhouse emissions and climate risk, while increasing health, well-being, and economic communities for our residents? Yeah, so when, when, when the toxic waste dump was being forced on the people on the southeast side of Chicago, I was part of the effort of the movement to push back against that. So let's just make something very clear. You will not have to sue my administration to make sure that there's a healthy environment for climate. Here's where there's also an incredible opportunity. Everything from a citywide, countywide composting um, operation, making sure that we are creating like real urban farms, Right? Because, listen, the fact of the matter is in many of our communities, we do not have access to, to food, right? You know, there's an entire environmental opportunity here that we, have, that we have to transform the way we see the environment. This is why biotechnology, the life sciences, again, green technology, expanding urban farms and centers so that we can grow our food, create economic development and jobs, while also making sure that we're building and expanding the affordable housing ordinance so that we can actually build up around these communities. They can be self-sustained by actually using the talent and the brilliance from the very people who make it up. Listen, especially to black folks, we've been building this country from the moment that we arrived. The environmental justice program is not something that we have to think hard about. It's just a matter of us investing in it, and I'm committed to doing that and working with county government to make sure that it happens. Well, that was a great, great time, answer, sir. Great time. Well, look, we need to create the infrastructure because there, there's going to be no, nothing is going to be accomplished unless we create the infrastructure and the system of accountability. So you need to create an EPA department that truly has autonomy and independence. And that department needs to be governed by a board drawn from the, the environmental community. So, and that department needs to be empowered and they need to have a budget and they need to have the resources and they need to have the ability to, whether it's to bypass the mayor's office or to bypass the city council, to go in and ensure that there is true environmental justice, to go in and ensure that there are no food deserts, to go in and ensure that there is a climate change plan that's going to be implemented. I mean, how many climate change plans have you seen in the last three or four years? Three or four? And they're never, never implemented. And to go in and ensure that we're getting lead out of our drinking water and the other contaminants, and not just force another generation of children to wait another five or 10 or 15 years while we, you know, it, you know in a very almost uh, glacial way, replace the lead pipes when we're poisoning children every day. Not just lead pipes, but other cancer-causing contaminants. So we need to create the infrastructure of accountability and give it the autonomy to go in and the resources to go in and do the job. Yes, you do Right, continuing on collaboration with the county topic. Over the course of the last two years, leaders in border states have been shifting the burden of migration towards northern cities. Communities across Chicago and Cook County, including Woodlawn, Burr Ridge, and Country South, now serve as their homes. How do you quell racial and economic tensions within communities of already limited resources and work in concert with the county to address the needs of both new and existing residents? You know, this is a, it's a tragedy that we have extremists, right-wing Republicans in particular, who are using human beings as political footballs. It's actually unconscionable, it's absolutely um, ridiculous. If we are a welcoming city and a region, we also have to be honest about the fact that many neighborhoods, particularly black neighborhoods, especially black neighborhoods, have been disinvested in. In fact, they've been defunded. Defunding of our schools, healthcare, jobs, housing, so we have to make sure that we are treating the people who are here, not just with dignity and respect, but make sure we're investing in them. But we also have to make sure that individuals who are seeking refuge here, 
that we provide a climate and environment for them to live and thrive. Whether you came from 55 or 57 North or from Central or South America, we got here to Chicago. There's enough for everybody. It really is. The table is big enough. Now listen, whether you like salt or sugar on your bricks, it'll be on my table. And for our brown families, whether you like red sauce or green sauce, it'll be on my table when I'm the mayor of the fifth floor. It's real simple. We need to make sure that all 77 communities are welcome communities. And not just target certain individual communities. When, when Gary Chico and I were uh, running the Chicago Public Schools, we had various influxes. Mr. Dallas, I'm so sorry, sir. Listen, I'm going to ask security if we can't respect the candidates when they're talking, just politely ask you to leave because clearly you are not interested. So please respect the candidates while they're talking. Mr. Dallas, please. Don't Can I restart again? Look, you know, the bottom line is 77 communities need to be welcoming communities. And there's no reason why 77 communities cannot comfortably absorb individuals who are coming in, regardless of the number. I, you know, I've gone through as, as budget director, and in New Orleans, we took Haitian immigrants in when, when the devastation of, of, uh, of, of Haiti uh, created a huge exodus, despite the fact that we were rebuilding an entire city. So there's no reason why all 77 communities can't be welcoming communities. But let me, you know, let me restate again, we've got to be welcoming communities to our returning citizens, and we are not. I mean, we've got to place as much emphasis, if not much greater emphasis, on those individuals who have returned to the community and, and, and have been denied uh, education and occupational training opportunities, have been denied jobs because they have criminal records, have been, uh, have been de denied housing uh, because of their criminal backgrounds. So we've got to be as welcoming, if not more welcoming, for those individuals who are returning to their community, who are returning citizens. We have to have a strategy to do that. Thank you very much. At this juncture, we're going to say thank you to our panelists for the national session. Welcome back our next panelists, uh, our next set of panelists, and that will be, give me one second here folks, there we go, we have three panelists, I should, I'm reading three names, first one, Mr. Halil Damir from the executive, he's the executive, executive director and founder of Zaka Foundation of America, Mr. Martin King, chairman of the Rainbow Push Coalition, <laughs> and Rabbi Michael Siegel, Senior Rabbi of Anshi Ernest Synagogue. Gentlemen, please all. Mr. Demir, you have the pleasure of leading us tonight. You have the first question. Thank you. And you know what? I'm sorry, I lost track. Who answered the last question? Was it Mr. Vallis or I Johnson? Think I did. So, Mr. Johnson, you will be answering first. Uh, gentlemen, good to be with you. Uh, the world is a small village. Whatever happens in far Wuhan of China, impact our lives. Uh, the global economy, if it happens in the United States, goes far all the way on the other side of the world. The poverty in Africa definitely has impact in Europe, on Europe and also in the United States. If you are a mayor, what would you do? Invite the investor from the world to this beautiful city of Chicago. We have a largest, uh, one of the largest airports here. We have a very multicultural city here. We have a very welcoming communities here. What would you do to invite these investors to come to this beautiful city? Yeah, thank you for that question. 
the city of Chicago is, it's really, a, it's obviously a global city. I mean, hundreds of languages are spoken here. And so we, this is why we have to be open to receiving the wealth of the rest of the globe. You know, what they were doing in Colombia around transportation has revolutionized their economy. So it's not just simply about inviting people here for businesses, but it's also shifting the dynamic around the typical American way of thinking that we are the only country that has good ideas. By modeling after many countries around the world who have been able to revolutionize their systems, we have to do that. The last thing I'll say is this. We have neighborhoods in the city of Chicago, like Garfield Park, that has been described as a developing nation because poverty and violence per capita reflects that. And so this moment that we're in is potentially transformational. And that's why whether it's biotechnology, whether it's life sciences, whether it's logistics, these are the type of corporations that we should invite to our city, but you actually have to have someone who reflects the values of our city. And that's why I'm the best choice in this moment, because I'm a value and I'm a reflection of the global world that we live in. Thank you. The great thing about our city is its diversity. I, I remember, you know, we had uh, schools that had 26 different languages we taught. And as a grandson of Greek American immigrants, and of course, from Turkey, and my condolences to the just the uh, traumatic events in Turkey. Turkey seems to have been ignored when it comes to, uh, you know, mobilizing public support to provide relief. Uh, I, mean, I went to Haiti 50 times uh, after the devastating earth earthquake. I remember going to. For the prince, it was like Hiroshima bomb that destroyed that capital. So at the end of the day, there's no reason why we can't work with the very communities that already exist within these, within the city to, to help reinforce their identities, to help uh, identify and allow them to stand out in terms of the uniqueness uh, and of their culture, of their history. There's no reason why you know we can't become, uh, you know, we cannot, uh, uh, there's no reason why we can't recruit uh, uh, partnerships with sister city programs with each of our multiple uh, immigrant communities uh, who basically dot our landscape. This has always been uh, a city of, of immigrants and there's no reason why we can't take full advantage of that to foster a close working relationship and invite bi businesses and investment from other countries who already have residents in this city itself. Yes, I do, sir. Second question. Uh, you, will, you will remember, uh, we all remember Pablo Escobar and the Medellin. Then a young uh, mayor came and he changed the destiny of Medellin. Today, Medellin probably one of the most welcoming cities. The refugee crisis in the world is uh, going to impact us that way or this way. When you look at uh, Chicago, we have all these uh, minority, minority businesses that can be easily bridged between us and the uh, prosperity that our communities enjoy can be enjoyed also in Africa or the communities that here, uh, Latino community for example. During the COVID, I used to distribute the food packages in the street of Chicago. I can see the poverty here and the same in, in the Latin American countries. How can we encourage the local businesses that build the bridges the prosper same time the communities they coming to encourage them to keep also the refugees wherever they are but same time give them opportunities what would your city do well first of all let me point out again that we have 77 communities they all need to be welcome welcoming communities but when i have gone into the communities when i've walked and visited those storefronts they tell me three issues three issues impact them one is public safety. They don't feel that the communities are safe. And regardless of where you go, public safety is a top priority. Number two, many of these businesses and fledging businesses feel that they're being strangled by City Hall. I'm just, just not talking about big businesses. I'm talking about small businesses, whether they're Indian businesses or Pakistani businesses. They all seem to be strangled when they want to expand, when they want, I mean, if they want even the most basic improvements in their buildings, they have to go through an entire bureaucracy, not to mention all the man of privilege. So just reducing the regulations and nurturing these businesses, because as these businesses expand and grow, it creates other opportunities, particularly uh, for, you know, for communities that are destination points 
uh, for, for immigrants who are coming abroad. So dealing with those two issues, I think, are critically important. And then the third thing is we've got to bring some sort of financial stability to those communities, and that means capping property taxes. That means holding the line on fees and fines, because many of these businesses are marginal businesses. If we nurture those businesses, we give them an opportunity to grow, uh, they will become, those communities will become inviting places, and we won't lose every successive generation to the suburbs and to other communities who seem to move out once economic opportunities present themselves. Well, what are the first things that we have to do is to make sure that we're listening um, to the communities? Um, the distance between the fifth floor and residents of the city of Chicago, we have to close that distance. I'm not a dictator. I'm not. I'm going to be your lover in chief as the mayor of the city of Chicago. Because the way we close that distance is by making sure that we are taking the ideas from the very cultures that know what's best for the communities that they serve. But it also requires us to be intentional about our investments. Look, the Invest Southwest program, the reason why it has missed the mark is because it's a reimbursement program. And in many instances, smaller businesses cannot front load the money. And so this is why I'm committed to not only reducing and eliminating the structural deficit, making up to a billion dollars worth of investments, micro grants to help small businesses grow and thrive, right? But we have to do this not with just putting a cap on property taxes. How about we just not raise them? By doing that, that actually encourages the very people who make up those communities to have the expendable income to actually support the businesses. Yes, there's a public safety dynamic to it, but if you don't have a clientele of workers, it don't matter what business you put out there. If people don't have jobs, don't to live, don't go to school, the small businesses, the coaches won't be able to manifest and grow. Under my administration, I'm going to be your lover in chief. Thank you so much, Mr. Demir. Mr. King, you are next. Undivided attention, please. Thank you. Good evening. First, let me give praise and honor to God for the opportunity to be of service. Let me thank all the panelists that have come before and those that are on stage with me now. Thank you to the candidates, candidates for attending, and I'd like to thank the Sopa Museum and Reverend Johnson for having the vision to have this forum. Give them a round of applause, please. <laughs> the city of Chicago is 13th, the 13th largest economy in the world by GDP standards. It's the third largest among U.S. cities. It has 35 of the Fortune 500 companies, including in them are ADM, United Airlines, McDonald's, but some have left. Citadel, Boeing, Tyson. O'Hare is the economic engine for the north side and the north suburbs. Midway is the economic engine for the southwest side of the city and the southwest suburbs. Tourism in the business district is the economic engine for the north side, the west loop, and the south loop. Do you support a third airport in the south end? Why or why not? Uh, yes, I mean, this has been something that um, has been an idea for a very long time. There you go. And the reason why I support it is because hundreds of billions of dollars have been invested in O'Hare. When we talk about collaborating with Cook County government and thinking more regionally, here's a clear example where we can do it. From the south side of Chicago in the, in the southern suburbs, it has to become an economic hub for the type of small businesses that we ultimately want, but you have to have anchor. And transportation provides that. It's a big deal. Look, Citadel is gone, but they're back in this race. Oh. Tim Griffin is going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars against a black man because I believe in black people. This is the same person who said that Rob Emanuel should have closed 125 schools. These individuals are dangerous. Make no mistake about it. The reason why they are trying to come back because the interests of working people are going to be on the, on the table on the fifth floor. And they want unfettered access to the wealth that they know is going to come even with the third airport. We have to make sure that we protect the interests of our people. And Citadel and King Griffin should not dictate who the next one is. Mr. Bells, we have 15 extra seconds on that. 
Let me try to answer the question without scaring you. First of all, I support the third airport. There needs to be a third airport, but there also needs to be an extension. There also needs to be access, a complete access to public transportation. So all of it, because the third airport it is just an, an entity that needs to be connected to the central business district. Every community needs to have access to affordable public transportation. So yes, I support a third airport, but I also support investing in public transportation so that no neighborhood is left behind. But you also need public safety because we are in a public safety crisis. We're are, we are in a situation where people are afraid to use mass transit. Uh, you know, so just establishing a third airport and just basically extending uh, the CTA service without ensuring that riding public transportation is as safe as going to the airport is not going to get the job done. So yes, I support a third airport. And yes, I support uh, the extension of the CTA so that no neighbor is left behind. But, but I also going to make public safety, uh, citywide public safety in every neighborhood, public safety, which is a human right, I will also make public safety a priority on public transportation. I have a, a second question. In the United States, we're often thought of as being the number one country in the world. But the, fact, the facts are not that we're the number one country in the world. We're seventh in literacy. 27th in math, 22nd in science, 49th in life expectancy, 178th in infant mortality, 3rd in median household income, 4th in labor force, 4th in exports. We're only number one in two categories, defense spending and the number of incarcerated citizens per capita. So, as mayor, you're not only the mayor of Chicago. You're head of the Public Building Commission. You're head of the Fire Department. You're head of the police department. You're head of CTA. You're head of the park district. You're head of Chicago Public Schools. Being mayor of Chicago is the third hardest job in the United States besides being Speaker of the House or President of the United States. So we need to understand that this race is more than just about being mayor. This is about all of Chicago and the region. So my question for you both is how as mayor Will your office ensure that minority and women-owned businesses and the goals that are set by the city are met in professional services, not just contractors, but in investment banking, money management, legal services, architects, concessions, and beyond? <laughs> Mr. Bellis. Well, I would do it by basically using the model that I used when I took all the public building commission uh, work out of the public building commissions, and I spent $3.2 billion building 30 new schools and 48 additions when the enrollment in Chicago Public Schools was growing by 40,000. And we did 55% minority contracting, including 32% uh, contracting with black male contract companies only, and, and we did 58% minority hiring. How did that happen? We set the goals. Now imagine taking that model. Incidentally, we also did 40% on or set targets on, and exceeded them on professional services. And Perry Erber, who of course runs this museum, and Rusty Castillo and, and uh, Natalie Pekin, they were the ones driving the process. Imagine if you took that model and you applied it to the $28 billion, the $28 billion that the city controls, that the city spends every day, CHA, CTA, the schools, the, I mean, you, the park district, you name it. Imagine if you applied that. Imagine if you applied that across the entire budget, not for one year, but for multiple years. And we actually also did target marketing, where we identified certain commodities and purchases and work that would be done exclusively by black owned businesses. That is a model that we implemented on a scale unsurpassed by any other municipality. And that is a model that I will bring to City Hall. That is a model I will bring to the budgets that the mayor controls. <laughs> You know, first of all, just on a very small practical level, we have to make sure that we eliminate the barriers for black-owned business, minority-owned businesses to be able to access those contracts and services, one. Second of all, I'm the only person on this stage who's ever been elected, who's ever, the only person on this stage who's ever won, right? And as a result of that, I had the ability to actually pass multi-billion dollar budgets, working in a collaborative way. I'm the only person on this stage who built an entire budget around black people. Why? As a result of that, President Preckman can use it as a guideline for equity planning. 
eliminating medical debt, violence prevention, it's working with those who are formerly incarcerated, uh, making sure that we're uh, in, investing in economic development. But let me also be very clear about this. Mr. Ballas, I ain't afraid, and neither are the people of the city of Chicago, but we are smart enough to recognize when people who invest in this race, when they don't have the best interests of All our right. people. We know the difference. And the fact of the matter is that we're talking about a global economy and making sure you have full participation. You can't have people financing your campaign who do not believe in the existence of black and brown people. By shutting schools and investing in putting more guns on the street, you can't have the type of economic growth if you don't believe that we have a right to exist. Fine, please. There, there is a rebuttal. Clearly, the rhetoric is flowing. The bottom line is I focused on focusing on the issues, and he focuses on everything else besides the issues. Brandon Bodie. Respond. Please respect. There, there is to be no, no objections, no, no interrupting the candidates, please. First of, first of all, voting for a budget is not managing a budget. The voting for MBWB is not managing MBWB. You know, rhetoric is no substitution for management. I've managed multi-billion dollars in four different cities. I rebuilt an entire school system in New Orleans where every child is in either a new school or a 100% renovated school. So the bottom line is, I've been dealing with these crises for years, and, I've, and equity has always been my guiding light. And it's, it's proven. It's proven in, in the results. Thank you, Mr. Bellis. 15 seconds left. He went over his time, 15 seconds on the dot. This dude can't count. Everywhere he has gone, he has mismanaged budget. No interrupting. The fact of the matter is, voting on a budget is managing a, a budget. I find it unconscionable for you to say that because I voted on a budget that a black man can't count and manage one. I've done both, though. I've done thank both. You. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Mr. King, thank you for your questions. Have I seen Mr. Johnson first. How will you convince leaders of large multinational corporations that Chicago is a safe place for their employees to live, work, and raise their families, based on the growing fear of crime in this city? How will you convince the tourism industry that Chicago is still one of the great American tourist destinations when so much of Michigan Avenue is shuttered, and when you drive down Michigan Avenue, there are police cars at every corner with their lights flashing. It's Mr. Johnson's question. You know, look, the vacancy that exists in the city of Chicago as a result of this, this global pandemic, it's a serious crisis, and we have to address it. One of the ways in which we, of course, we address public safety is by doing what safe American cities do, right? We have to solve crime. We have to do it. We have to rebuild confidence in the city of Chicago that when, if, if a carjacking takes place and we cannot solve those crimes, how do we expect law enforcement to have confidence that they can solve the more serious crimes? And that's why I'm investing in 200 more detectives. But here's the bigger dynamic. You need a champion and a cheerleader. Someone who actually loves people enough to be able to take this around the world to include no interrupting, please. Biotech, biotechnology, logistics, all of these different things. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Mr. Johnson, I'm starting your time. Listen, my family fights over the Thanksgiving menu, and it's the same menu every year. We're going to be just fine, you all. We're going to be just fine. We're going to be just fine. We, we get to have disagreements. We're okay, Chicago. We're okay. Biotechnology, logistics, all of these opportunities are available in the city of Chicago. But the business of Chicago is the education of Chicago. That's how we engender confidence for the individuals who are prepared and willing to invest in here. We have the best talent in the city of Chicago. It's a matter of making sure that we are closing the gap between education opportunities and job opportunities. That's how we engender support from corporations around the country 
in the final world that we're going to be friendly, that we're going to provide incentives, but we're going to have a workforce that's prepared to embrace the corporations that are prepared to set up shop here in the city of Chicago. Thank I'll you. do that as mayor. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Dallas. Look, public safety is your overriding issue. And if you talk to all the business associations, whether they're downtown or on the west side and the south side, they will tell you that they feel unsafe. They will tell you that they're having trouble recruiting workers because sometimes it's for public safety service. You talk to the CTA or all the CTA unions, they're, the reason they can't fill their vacancies is because people are afraid. So at the end of the day, you've got to make public safety a priority. And let me point out that 200 detectives is, is New York has 6,000 detectives. You have, a you have 1,100 police vacancies that are in the budget that have not been filled. They're spending $100 million on privatized security in the CTA. They don't make arrests. They run away uh, when they're confronted. And at the end of the day, they're not making the CTA secure. I'm not talking about spending another dollar more than currently is budgeted in the police department, but I am talking about filling vacancies. I am talking about bringing retired police officers and officers who have transferred uh, to other districts who will return if there's new, new leadership. And I am talking about pushing more than 53% of the officers that are on the force and are in the districts right now having 80 to 90 percent of the officers pushed down to the local districts so that it so instead of waiting three hours for a 911 response you're going to get a response in three minutes and the officers if somebody is violating the law assaulting and battering they are actually they are actually arresting that that individual thank you both Chicago is a complex city. I think that we can all agree on that. And Chicago also has a very troubled past. This city has a $28 billion budget. And these conversations are job interviews for the two of you, for the citizens of Chicago to make the most thoughtful choice as to who should be mayor of the city of Chicago at a pivotal moment. What qualifies you to manage the city in the way that it needs to be managed? This is a global question because this conversation is being watched around the world and whoever leads the city is going to help either raise it up or continue a downward spiral. Yeah, you know, Mr. Thank you. So let me respond by saying I've been managing multi-billion dollars in budgets in multiple states. And when I was city budget director, we actually balanced our budget, did 70% street resurfacing, did the automatic menu, put 13,500 police officers on, on the street. And we got bond rating upgrades, and we did not increase property taxes a penny. When we ran the Chicago Public Schools, at the end of those six years, our enrollment had grown by 40,000. We have 78 new buildings that we have built, and I got 12 bond rating upgrades. And Gary Chico and I were selected as Man of the Year by Cranes and Motorola, and we were recognized by President Clinton in at least, I think, one or perhaps even two State of Union addresses. And when President Obama came back to Chicago, he elected to run the Chicago Public Education uh, a Fund. So at the end of the day, I've been managing multi-billion dollars all my life. Those are just the facts, the clear facts, the indisputable facts. And that's what brought me to Philadelphia, and that's what brought me to New Orleans to rebuild an entire city that had the school system that had been, des uh, uh, that had been devastated from Hurricane Katrina and secure a $2 billion unprecedented FEMA settlement with the much maligned Bush administration. So that's a record. I've been managing multi-billion dollar budgets and responding to every invitation for help, whether it was domestic or whether it was going to Haiti, going to Khartoum in Sudan, going to Santiago after, the earth, after that earthquake, or chairing Sean Penn's organization that did relief in six different Caribbean countries. So, uh, yeah, thank you for that question. It's actually a very powerful one. So I grew up in a very large family with 10 of us. I've shared this story multiple times. But it, but it does speak to my value system. I was ra raising a house, working class family with one bathroom. I learned early in life how to negotiate. <laughs> Here's what the goal was. It was 10 of us, my parents were also foster parents. The goal was for every person to leave out the house clean. Now how we got there, figured it out, the goal was for everybody else to get out the house clean. I've learned early how to negotiate and work with people. 
My father as a pastor taught us something. It's very clear. Whatever we do in life, we have to possess very simple characteristics. This is why I believe I'm the best fit for the city of Chicago and the impact that it's going to have in the world. You have to have someone who's compassionate, collaborative, and competent. That's what the city of Chicago deserves right now. That's what the country deserves. Someone is going to make sure that we see people, we value people. Now, yes, there are some divisive natures that try to separate us, but we have to tell people the truth. When people are wrong, tell the, tell the truth about it. There you go. Right? But we also have to make sure that we're working with people, collaborating with people. We're going to work with everyone in this room, across the city. But we also have to make sure that we're competent. We are failing these systems because we don't have people who are competent enough to carry them out. I possess those. I'm looking forward to running this city, and I humbly ask for your support. Brian for Chicago Dad Guy. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, candidates, thank you very much for your professionalism. Uh, the answers to, your, to the questions that we, hope, that we got tonight hopefully will help us make this decision, this generational decision. I appreciate the questions that we have from such a diverse three panels. I, I think we have to give the panelists a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. And now I want to turn it back to Reverend Johnson, and I wish you both luck in uh, this job because we know how important it is. Give it up for these panelists, Antonio Romanucci, please, one more time. And this is where I thank the panelists to excuse you all. Thank you so very much. Mark, Martin, Leo, Rabbi, thank you so much. So we are coming to the close of this forum. Um, even as I thank the candidates for their decorum and their insightful answers, I am duty-bound to give each of you one minute for closing statements. Please, Mr. Ballas, would you start? Yeah, well, first of all, let me thank you. Let me thank you for hosting this. Uh, the panels were excellent. The questions were pointed. They were substantive. And I, I just be, appreciate the opportunity to basically articulate my position. You know, I, I've really endeavored to, to really focus on the issues, focus on the core issues and offer substantive um, suggestions and recommendations on how I would address the issues of public safety, how I would address the issues of schools, and how I would address the issues of transforming this $20 billion budget into the type of community investment vehicle that leaves no Chicago behind, that leaves no neighborhood behind. I mean, I'm running for mayor for all of Chicago. When people say Chicago uh, has to become the city that works again, Chicago has never been the city that works for everyone. And I'm here say I'm not running for mayor, I'm running for Chicago because I want to make sure that Chicago is the city that works for everyone. I think my great success has always been my ability to draw from the community the type of leadership team that can ensure that I can have success, whether it was here in Philadelphia, New Orleans, or elsewhere. That has always been a source of my strength and a source of my effectiveness. So I'm offering those, uh, I'm offering that type of leadership and, and I just want to thank you all for coming tonight and I'm like, once again, thank you, Reverend, for a really insightful and enjoyable forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Johnson, you can have a minute and 15 seconds. Yeah, thank you again, Reverend Johnson, and to everyone who participated this evening. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity to exchange ideas with Paul Vallis. Look, in October, I was polling at 2.3%. No one thought that I would be here today. But I'm also that kid who grew up in a home where you would come home and the water wasn't on. Or the orange extension cord from our window to our neighbor's window just to make sure the refrigeration. I'm probably the least likeliest person to be on this stage. But I am so grateful to God that he has put us in a position to do something transformational. There's a reason why I'm here today is because I've been part of a movement, you all. We have a multicultural, multi-generational movement that has catapulted us into a place that is ultimately transformational. On April 4th, the day that we commemorate the life and the legacy of Dr. King, we need to actually vote on our principles and values. No matter who you are and where you live, you get to live in a healthy, safe environment. You get to have a fully funded neighborhood school, reliable transportation, health care, and jobs. Dr. King said that if the labor rights movement and the civil rights movement were to ever collide, what an enormous potential it would be. And sisters and brothers, we are in that potential. We get to live out the dreams of our ancestors, and I'm counting on your vote. Brandon from Chicago.com. Yeah. Right, Brandon Johnson and Paul Ballas. Stand up and thank you very much for joining us.
Thank you all for coming. Have a great and safe evening.